Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And on today's episode, I am going to be joined by Justin Newell. He is the CEO at Inform, and Inform is focused on optimizing your business through software. And we're going to dive a little bit further into that today. We're going to talk a lot about increased capacity demands and how they're impacting warehouse flows. And we're going to talk about their workforce utilization solution that's helping you optimize your workforce even more, your existing workforce with some of those labor challenges out there. So we're going to dive into that with Justin today. And Justin, welcome to the show. How Thanks, are you? Kevin. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Definitely happy to have you on. Happy to talk about this. I think there's a lot of uh, conversation around doing more with less these days. That seems to be a big time theme in uh, supply chain, especially in warehouse operations overall. Uh, so very excited to dig into this and talk to you a little bit about how Inform is helping with this. Um, but before we get started, for people that maybe are not familiar, why don't you give us a brief overview of Inform and, and what you guys do? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Inform is a company that's been around for about 55 years. We're an AI-based solutions company. Uh, founded in Germany. We actually were founded out of the university um, and we started in operations research. And uh, again, we're, we're based in Aachen, which is kind of an AI engineering hotspot in Germany. Uh, I was in the automotive space when I was younger in my career and kind of Stuttgart's more of the automotive mecca. Aachen is more of what we would call kind of the technology mecca. And um, so we're a company that provides uh, process AI, automation, optimization, business agility, and, uh, and we're even starting to incorporate, obviously, a lot of the things that people are talking about today, like generative AI, um, chatbots, co-pilots, large language models. And distinctively, Inform is involved in, in a large number of industries, but very specific industries. So uh, we're involved in industries like logistics, um, demand and supply chain planning, inventory optimization, um, aviation and ground handling. We're big in the aviation world, so really looking at above and below in services, uh, we do workforce management, which is part of what we'll talk about today a little bit. And uh, obviously, we're in inbound, outbound, truck and time slot management and scheduling, intelligent yard management, uh, intralogistics, supply chain, line side management within manufacturing facilities, production plan, planning, uh, and, and then some other areas. And then vehicle logistics is another space that we kind of play independently in which really touches the entire vehicle supply chain from factory to dealer to compound, uh, doing some strategic network planning in that space, um, route optimization and things of that nature. And, uh, and then we also get into container terminal management, uh, returnable containers. And one thing that's in interesting that I looked up, we touch about 14 million transactions per day um, from various different oh, customer wow. systems in the supply chain world alone. Uh, so that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big area. And then one last thing that's not really as interesting from the logistics side, but interesting for Inform, we also play in the fraud and risk space and fraud prevention. So we're also working in any money laundering, mm -hmm. sanction screening, which is kind of important with the current war that's going on, um, wire transaction mm -hmm. monitoring, and people trying to constantly stay ahead in the fraud scheme. So we also play in that role too. Interesting, interesting, and obviously covering a, a breadth of things there uh, for sure. And I, I see all the the aviation behind you there too. So yeah, that, a little combination of uh, automotive and aviation put together. My favorites, which is a del old Delta <laughs> cargo plane with a uh, Porsche three fifty six being loaded onto it. So. Oh, nice, nice. Some nice cargo there. Yeah, sure. yeah. I was with. Uh, I spent about fifteen years of my career with Porsche, working in various. Uh, oh, wow. you know, I was in. Originally in the after sales side, I spent some time helping manage some of their distribution facility related activities uh, when I first joined them and then kind of transitioned into procurement, which I, I'm surprised I made it through that process because that's a challenging role to play in the procurement world. And then finished my career with Porsche uh, on the vehicle logistics, quality supply chain activities. That's really managing North American uh, vehicle logistics for Porsche. So really everything from vehicles going onto the ocean and getting to the dealer. Very nice. Very cool. Very cool. And so I, I'm curious, too. I mean, you guys have been around for, for quite some time, and Form has. And, and you mentioned that you, you've been focused on, on AI for, for a long time. So, And, and I think in the uh, general uh, topic of discussion around AI, just in the last two years now, it's really come to the surface for just the everyday person talking about. So I'm curious how that kind of conversation has 
evolved over the years and how the demand and awareness around that has evolved too? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, I recently attended an automotive manufacturers, Alabama Automotive Manufacturers Association. And as you can imagine, when, it, when you're talking about warehousing or production manufacturing, there's a lot of conversation around what level of people have adopted automation. And that's quite high. I mean, in, in a lot of areas with different technologies, robotics and things of that nature. But then when you talk about artificial intelligence, there's kind of three phases. And there was a professor from the University of Auburn, and he mentioned that roughly when it comes to artificial intelligence, I think the statistic were somewhere in the 70 to 80 percent. People have heard uh, the term artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, fuzzy logic, whatever it might be. There's more companies that have adopted a strategy. It's more in the 30% of companies that really have some form of artificial intelligence strategy built into, we must do this in the coming years, and the adoption's below 20%. So there's even less companies that have actually incorporated uh, artificial intelligence, and it could be generative AI, it could be co-pilots, it could be different things. But what we really focus on is process AI, so operation-based, you know, helping workers, you know, one, giving them guidance in digital decision making to help them do their job on a daily basis and really helping the operation be very, very strategic. And you always have disruptions in, it could be, you know, airport operations, uh, it could be in a massive warehouse environment, people call out, people leave early, um, there's delays in activities. And if you don't have something that can help kind of perform process maneuvering of that staff and scheduling in real time, um, you're ultimately going to lose a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, efficiencies that you have in your staff. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, artificial intelligence is a huge factor right now. People love to use it as a buzzword. A lot of people love to say that it's incorporated in their solutions. And in firms, uh, yeah. artificial intelligence <laughs> journey started around 1985. So we've really been doing artificial intelligence for probably the last 20 plus years. And, uh, and wow. pretty strong in that world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's interesting, too, to see that evolution, because uh, you mentioned that, you know, some companies are trying to position themselves with AI now, too, and, you know, throwing on, like, dot .ai to their name and, and things like that. I think it's pretty interesting to see uh, just how much attention that's, that's capturing, uh, not just in our industry and our marketplace, but just in the world in general overall. Um, so, so very interesting there. Um, so, I, I mean, let's talk a little bit about uh, from the, the warehouse operations side of things, you know, as we look at things and obviously, you know, there's been a higher push, higher demand on, on warehousing and operations, especially with e-commerce continuing to, to grow with a huge growth spike during the pandemic and now, you know, steadily continuing to grow, even though it's not growing at the same uh, rapid rate during that period. Um, but as those kind of increased uh, capacity demands come out and we're looking to get more out of our operations, consumers are looking for more faster delivery. They're looking for more visibility, transparency. How do those start to kind of weigh on and impact the overall warehouse operational flows that are happening? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that's important is labor shortages. I mean, that comes up in a lot of areas. Obviously, what I would call skilled and non-skilled labor, that's that seems to be really at the core of where the shortage are. We, we know we have driver shortages, and I worked for a transportation company before coming to Inform, and uh, that was real. It didn't matter what you were transporting, there was a driver shortage. So if you were transporting cars, if you were transporting yeah. food, fruit, whatever it is, there's a shortage. And I think with the retiring population of the baby boomers and there's less people in the workforce that are able to work these days that's causing issues and you know we were actually with an OEM last week and we were talking about the impacts because you had COVID you had supply chain disruptions you had chip shortages you had all these different factors and I think a lot of people didn't realize that the maritime community it took them a long time to get their vessels back on track it took them a long time to get the container uh, movements back into the right sequence where they actually had empty containers where they needed them, where the full containers were where they needed to be. And so that right sizing of the entire industry, that didn't just happen in two months, it didn't happen in one year, it's still happening. It's still really working its way out. And one example that they had was in a warehouse perspective, if you've got labor shortage issues, for example, on the West Coast, they're getting massive backloads of containers right now. So what's happening is, 
they can't put yeah. stuff away fast enough so they can't they can't do stock put away operations fast enough they can't pick and pull fast enough they can't do inventory fast enough all these critical things that happen in a distribution center and so what's happening is now they've got off-site locations where they're storing trailers now you've got situations where they have no visibility of what's off-site they've got no prioritization going on of hey this trailer really would have been better to pull that one in first because it's got back ordered material that we could suffice orders with that could shut down a line somewhere and so there's all of these different things that are going on and what they basically said was it's a mess it's a real mess they don't they don't have any way to solve that problem. So that's where intelligent yard systems, that's where visibility, that's where workforce management, looking at stuff, at staff and, uh, scheduling and being creative, using our artificial intelligence to say, hey, maybe we're not working eight hour days. Maybe we're working sometimes 10 hour days, only three days a week. Maybe we're working four hour schedules. You have to get really creative in that world. So um, but that's a little bit about what, what I think I'm seeing today and, and it's not going to get any better. We're going to have to find ways to engage people uh, and make those jobs attractive and give them the tools that help make the job attractive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's that's one thing too. I mean, I think where you look at the the challenges around labor, you know, it's like you said, the, the job in the warehouse is not necessarily the most attractive. And I think we've seen just kind of so many, I guess, at that level of that type of work so many other options now for people to do that are more flexible you know from a gig worker perspective and things of that nature it's you know it's hard to you know sell somebody on coming to to move some boxes around all day long and do heavy lifting and repetitive movements and, and things like that when you know they could maybe you know be in their car driving people around through Uber or, or whatever the case may be instead. So I, I think it's pretty, it's certainly a challenge. And like you said, that challenge leads to an overall kind of ripple effect throughout the entire operation where you're getting backed up on the inbound side and then you end up getting backed up on all the other processes too. So I, I mean, around those labor challenges, I mean, how do you kind of look at your existing workforce that is in place, whether it's enough people to meet the capacity you need to meet or it's not enough people i mean how do you get the most out of that workforce and i guess how do you kind of help in in some ways with um uh, the software side on from inform yeah i think on the uh, on the staff scheduling and what we would call the are the name of our solution is workforce plus and we really look at you know not only a day of but we look at multiple days out so we look at that tactical planning it could be three days out, it could be one week out. And there's so many different metrics that come into employee scheduling. There comes into consideration of, you know, what, what are the employees' needs? So what, what do they need in their scheduling? What days do they need off? When do they need to leave early? Uh, there's the unforeseen, there's the sicknesses, there's the call outs, there's things of that nature. Um, you also have labor agreements, depending on which customer it is. There could be a labor agreement you have to adhere to. You've got regulatory issues. Uh, overtime, um, you know, required amount of downtime, depending on what kind of job it is, there might be a required number of downtime that you have to have for the position, uh, especially in transportation. And so you've got all these scheduling conflicts, and what you ultimately have to do is, is quickly analyze all those different parameters, and then to make it even more complex, you're adding in, oh, by the way, is there a certain certification? Is there a certain requirement that this employee needs to do that particular job within the warehouse? Are they forklift certified? Uh, are they certified to use a particular packing or loading type of piece of equipment? And these are something human intelligent planners are trying to plan that labor. And constantly throughout the day or the week, they get all these different changes to the schedule. They can't keep up. Whereas when you get into an intelligent workforce planning solution, it's constantly looking at all those parameters and in real time it's shifting those those capabilities and sometimes it could be that you have a delay let's say for example you've got a delay maybe with a trailer coming into a dock door and the normal stance would be well we just sit around and we wait until the, the trailer shows up and in the meantime we're not doing anything if the system's looking at it saying well there's no trailer at the dock door these people are all certified to do packing or outbound activities let's immediately shift them to those outbound activities have them working on that. The minute that we get notification that now the trailer's at the door and we can actually inbound the product and start stocking and putting things away, we reshift. And in an environment where you don't have an ability or you don't have a solution 
that's helping the human intelligence manage those operations, I think you miss out. You get a lot of standing around. You also don't have any KPIs around um, your labor statistics. How long does it, does it average to take for someone to put away a particular pallet of something? How long does it take them to you know, do a packing, packing line operation? And if you're utilizing systems that track those jobs and help you track those jobs, one, you have better KPIs for expect, expected you know, uh, work performance, um, but you're also working with the employee. You're giving them, I think, a more satisfying job option. I mean, employees don't want to, in, in the days of, you know, my, my days of running distribution centers many years ago, it was either Excel, it, it might have not even been Excel. We looked at Green Bar, we come in and flip Green Bar in the morning. And I think the younger generation, they want some form of technology. They want to be, they want to be incorporated into the shift planning. They want to be considered and they want to be invested into automation, AGVs. It's not taking their job away. If anything, I think it's it's augmenting and giving them a better job, a better, safer job. And I think these are just some of the factors that we've got to look at right now. Yeah, very, very interesting points there. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense too. I mean, to your kind of one of your, your last points there about the younger generation and getting them involved with the technology. I mean, at this point, I think if we look at, uh, I guess, like Gen Z and then the generation coming behind them, I mean, they've grown up digitally in, in a sense. I mean, there hasn't been a, a period in, in time where they didn't know what a smartphone was, right? Or a smartphone wasn't, wasn't there. I mean, I know when I was a kid, like, you know, like we still had, uh, when I was very little, we still had the, the phone in a bag, right? Uh, my, my parents had in the car for emergency only, right? And I didn't now, even have that, to be honest. You know, I remember, I think I, my, first, yeah. my first job in my early 20s when I got that larger looking phone where you pulled the antenna out and you were so yeah. proud of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, certainly that generation coming in to the workforce is expecting that technology to be there. Um, and, and I'm curious, you, you talked about the, the KPIs and the metrics within there. And in some cases, uh, you said, you know, they don't even have them to, to begin with. But I'm curious, as you start to engage with some customers and you start to put the solutions in place and you start to track these metrics and KPIs, I mean, what are some of the, the biggest kind of things that stand out to you that uh, like operations are, are missing from like a workforce utilization perspective. Like where is there real, real gaps that are noticeably happening on a frequent basis um, through this data? Yeah, I think sometimes, sometimes operations, they go into it thinking that, you know, if I take an airport, for example, they think about it takes people so long to get to a gate, you know, they have to move a wheelchair, they have to move a tug, whatever it might be. And sometimes you go into it and you plan your operation based on certain assumptions that, that the business has made on the timing, what it takes. And maybe when you set up an operation initially, maybe at the very beginning of the operation when it wasn't very busy, um, maybe the initial planning, those were, those were accurate. But over time, based on volume, maybe now the distribution went from picking 10,000 lines a day, maybe it's now picking 50,000 lines a day. And those things, mm -hmm very quickly evolve and if you're not looking at those time studies and getting constant feedback your old assumption that may not be that far back maybe a year ago now may not be accurate anymore so it could be that maybe the employee that needed to go from point a to b within a distribution facility it used to take them 15 minutes to get from point to point a to point b maybe it takes them 20 minutes to get from point a to point b now so now that whole timing is off and I think that those are some of the things, you know, when you really do process mapping, business process mapping with a customer, and you look at their yard layout, you look at all the different complexities, um, sometimes I think it's eye-opening for the customer that they walk through and think, wow, we, we, did the, we did this study, we walked through it, and yeah, that employee's always been kind of telling us that, you know, I can't get it done, it's just too far of a distance to go and get something yeah. even in a forklift and bring it back in time. And sometimes then that cripples another step in the operation. And once you do those process mapping steps and you get into the, the real operational detail, a lot of times it's eye opening where they're like, okay, now we get it. Now we understand. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that applies to any type of really critical time sensitive operation, even like the container terminal world, you know, when you've got vessel ship to shore operations going on, you're optimizing container movements, then you've got to get those to either rail or truck. If you don't get them to rail or truck, the trucks can't get out. They can't get back in and do another turn that same day. 
the next thing you know, your your backlog of containers, Long Beach, good example, last year, they can't keep up. The next thing you know, you've got a hundred vessels that are anchored off the shore. So it's it's just one of those real yeah. quick trigger points where <clears throat> it just slips and slips and slips, and nobody really knows maybe always what are the key drivers behind it. And next thing you know, you're in a scenario where you know you've got 50 containers off-site down the street that you never planned for. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's such a great point there about how your business starts to, to grow and you don't change your expectations in a sense from a productivity standpoint, like the, the case where you mentioned, you know, it's, before it's taking uh, five minutes, now it's taking 20 minutes, and you never take the time to, like, break that down and, and see that, and I've certainly been in situations too in my, in my career where you know, employees are saying, well, is, what is taking longer now? Because we added, like, another step or something or we change the layout a little bit and uh and you know you're still saying like oh well the goal is still this the goal is still this the goal and you're not hitting the goal right and they're like well how can we hit the goal right and when you start to break it down and see those things i mean you definitely can be eye-opening for sure to say like oh wow we made this change and it really is having like a huge impact over time um so uh, i'm curious i mean how do you kind of Look at that when you come into an operation, because certainly there's a ton of data involved in, you know, coming up with these solutions and being able to have this this visibility and putting that data into uh, a way that's that's visible and, and makes it usable. Um, so what does kind of the the setup and foundationally you mentioned the process mapping in there? I mean, what does that process look like when you engage with the customer and are starting to bring in some of these solutions to help them tackle and, and see some of these problems that they're having? Yeah, I think the first most important thing, and you know, being a software solution provider, I tell people we, we are a software solution provider. We need to sell software, so we won't continue to be around. We've been around for 55 years, so we've done a pretty good job of doing what we want to do and what we're supposed to do. But we are very mm -hmm. academic. You know, we came out of the university, we came out of operations research. So what's at the core of everything that Inform does is how can we help businesses improve efficiency? And we typically see when we give, when we engage with a customer, it depends on where they're at in their journey prior to engaging with us. It could be that they've already gone through Kaizen, they've gone through a lot of efficiency improvements. It could be that they've not done any of that. So we might get someone that maybe is pretty streamlined, that's done a great job, and maybe we still find five to eight percent optimization efficiency results and savings in their operation. But if it's a if it's a company that maybe hasn't gone through any type of change management, workforce management type issues, or or I shouldn't say issues, but if they haven't gone through the exercises of doing that, we could see as high as thirty-five to forty percent efficiency improvements. So we're looking at distances, we're looking at mapping the process as far as how the day-to-day -day goes but what are the key requirements that they have in their day-to-day -day operations? And I guess you can label them pain points. Where today is the business experiencing the biggest issue? Are they experiencing it in the dock door utilization, meaning the dock doors are jammed up all the time? Are they experiencing it in pick pack? Are they experiencing it at the end of the line at nighttime trying to get trucks loaded outbound? So really looking at what are the areas where they're having the biggest pain points, don't just come in and try and sell a company a solution because, and, and you also don't want to take a company's today operations and emulate those into a brand new AI-based solution. You really want to say, okay, we're going to change management. We have to let the system do what it's supposed to do. You need to educate the employees and you need to involve them in the process change. And, and then, you know, because what you don't want to do is install brand new expensive technology and keep doing business the way you've been doing it for 30 years. So you need to have a, a true focus on what are the goals, what's the target, is it to get to the cloud, is it to get the infrastructure changed out, do you have old legacy systems that needed to be ripped out because they can no longer be supported? We find this a lot in a lot of the industries that we play. And uh, so you've gotta have those, those end goals and strategy targets with the customer. And the first focus is listen and understand what are today's pain points and what's really causing their operation the biggest setbacks and, and how can we quickly rectify those? Mm. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, and I think breaking down all those different parts of the operation, really understanding like what's going on and then how are we going to, I think one, understanding 
you know, to your earlier points, how are we going to measure these in the, in the first place, right? To understand what's really going on on an ongoing basis and then understanding what's been happening and then start to make those improvements based on that, I think is a, is a great way to go about it and a great approach to, to do that. And then putting the software in place that's going to help you to do that makes makes a ton of sense. Um, so very interesting uh, insights here and, and very interesting to, to look at some of the, these challenges and how you guys are, are helping to address some of those challenges right now. But as we look at towards the future and we look towards the, the workforce in general and how it's being utilized and some of these labor challenges too that we've talked about, uh, how do you see the workforce utilization kind of evolving over the next few years? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I think one thing that's interesting is what motivates the, the workforce today, the age of the workforce today. It's very different than when maybe when I was in distribution center work 15, 20, 30 years ago, the prior generation. Everybody today is motivated different. So I think what we have to determine is, as you mentioned already once before, I mean, the, the generation that I would put that's currently doing a lot of these roles in distribution, warehouse activities, yards, they're younger, they expect technology, they like technology, they, they want to be more involved in the process, um, they like more flexibility in their shift planning, um, and it's the companies that, that give them the tools, could be augmented reality for training, um, you're seeing visualization for safety where they've got goggles that they can see the training guides that are directly in the visualization of the goggles showing them, here's the instructions how to do it. Um, you know, I think training's huge. The companies that do the best job in training, the companies that do the best job in safety, and the companies that do the best in engaging their workforce and making it a better job. I don't think employees, you mentioned early in the part of, the, of this podcast about, you know, employees don't want to go to work and do a mundane task all day long. Nobody wants to do it. But if you can take, yeah. if artificial intelligence solutions can do digital decision making, that let's say make most of those 80% decisions that are very mundane. It's very easy for the system to say, yep, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this again. Uh, and leave the, what I would call more of the um, exception-based and the critical decisions that maybe occasionally you have to say, yep, something, this doesn't fit in the realm, let the employee make that decision. And so what we're doing is kind of elevating the employee and their decision-making ability, giving them digital decision-making um, support uh, at their level of job and on a management ability, we're giving them really the ability to see, you know, the workforce, to see the operations and all those little things that are snags um, throughout the day and throughout the week that before, if you don't have these types of technologies, uh, you're just not going to see and they're not going to be brought to your attention. And, uh, and so I think all those different feedback points, even machines, we're talking, you're looking at robotics, you're looking at AGV vehicles, you're looking at autonomous vehicles now. We've had a lot of conversations with companies using autonomous shunting vehicles, autonomous tugs, and these vehicles, they can't do their job unless you have an intelligence system that tells them how to map their way through the facility, through the warehouse. And so there, there's all part of that in play. And some of the jobs that those autonomous vehicles are doing are actually allowing people not to do those dangerous jobs. It's keeping them a little bit yeah. safer. And so if you've got the labor shortage, put the machine or put the robotic or put the technology in the area where you can then take the human to a more valuable place. And uh, so I think that that's what you're going to see over the next few years. And again, from a just being really eager and interested, the, the culture and the, the future of, of the workforce, they don't want to work in Excel based spreadsheets all day long. They, they want, they want some technology that's engaging and that's interesting and that gives them feedback that's real time. And, uh, and so I think that's where we're seeing a huge, huge amount of change right now. Yeah, yeah, I think those are great points. And I think, you know, if you boil it down, it's kind of like using the technology to make that employee's job that uh, they want to do better and then making the ones that they don't want to do uh, automated in some way or, you know, altering them in a way that they're not doing those parts that are so, I guess, undesirable or, or not wanted. But I think either way, you need to embrace that technology to be able to, to help the workforce do more and then also uh, feel more comfortable within the, the workplace too. Because if we look at our personal lives, right, I mean, we're all kind of 
consumed by technology at this point and you know that needs to translate into the workforce as well to have those same type of user uh, experiences and, and interfaces as well to be comfortable working with that technology so i think a really great uh points from you here justin and very interesting and insightful conversation and, and topic here as well um, and very interesting how you're you're looking at the approach and, and breaking down these different processes to see where there's opportunities to, to measure better and then take action based on those measurements through your your software solution so thank you for joining me today on the the show and if people are interested in learning more about inform and and what it is that you do what's the best way to do that yeah the best way to be to go to our website um uh, which is www.inform-software.com um, and uh, basically, you know, you'll see all of our strategic solutions out there. You'll see workforce management, intelligent truck and time slot management. You'll see all the various verticals that we play in. And, and again, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not what I would call a salesy company. So it's really about approach. And if somebody comes to us with, a, with an opportunity where we don't think it's the right fit, maybe the scalability of the operation, we could install a solution, but it's not going to provide the value, the ROI, and the true benefit. We might say, you know what, it makes sense to wait for two years until your, your volume increases and your complexity, your complexity increases. So we're really wanting to partner with companies um, to help them in their growth uh, and their journey as, as it relates to, to artificial intelligence and true process AI you know, around their day-to-day -day business activities. So. Hmm. All right, great. And, and good that you guys are focused on that and helping to... Uh... I guess, inform the, the customers about everything that's going on. I like the name there. Um, so we will post all that information at the new warehouse.com as well. So people can easily find it. So Justin, thank you once again for your time on the show today. Yeah. Thanks so much, Kevin. Appreciate you having me. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into today's video here on our YouTube channel, the new warehouse podcast. And I appreciate you tuning in. If you liked what you saw, make sure you subscribe to our channel. And if you like this video in particular, make sure you like it as well. And if you want to get this great t-shirt that you see in the video behind me, warehouses are sexy, head to warehousesaresexy.com and get your own.